Okay, good evening, brothers and sisters. Uh, I'm your pastor, the uh, Dr. Larry D. Tatum. I'm here this evening to share with you from our Wednesday midweek service to share with you the Word of God. We want to thank those of you that uh, uh, have tuned in, those who will be tuning in with us today and sharing with us at this evening time uh, for sharing God's Word. We praise God for another day and we praise God for His mercy that uh, the Bible says is new every morning. We've experienced the newness of His mercy and His grace and His love, tender loving care, kindness, and we're grateful to Him for that. We're grateful for our families and for our friends. We're grateful for our brothers and sisters of the congregation where we serve. We are still under the quarantine or the quarantine of this COVID-19. Of course, I did go out today uh, for a few moments. Uh, it's a beautiful day here in Cleveland, Ohio. Beautiful sunshine today, which is quite unusual for this part of the country. But uh, we had a beautiful day today. Looking forward to even days more beautiful as we move forward into the season. We uh, ask that you would uh, pray for us. Pray for uh, the New Sardis Church family, as well as for the sick of the New Sardis Church family, for the bereaved of the New Sardis Church family, as well as for those persons in general. Uh, Deacon David Prater's brother went home to be the Lord, James Prater. I ask that you pray specifically for the Prater family. I ask you again that you pray for the family of Brother Andrew, Brother Carrie Andrews, uh, for his wife's side of the family, ask that you would pray for them as they're still wrestling with uh, some aspects of the live virus, all right? So, uh, without any further preliminaries, we're going to go right to the Word of God. Hope you have your Bibles open and you're ready to share with us this evening from the word. I, I think, I do think that this evening we've got a, a interesting word for you in uh, considering the time in which we are living and the experiences that we are all dealing with right now. I think we have a pretty inter interesting subject matter to deal with. I want you to turn in your Bibles to uh, St. John's Gospel, chapter 4. And I want to begin reading at uh, verse, uh, let's see here. Let's start reading this evening at verse 19. Verse 19 of St. John's Gospel, chapter 4. And here's uh, what we find. Verse 19, the woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive, perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where man ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, he said. Let me turn my page here. My fingers don't work like they used to. The hour cometh, and now is. When the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit. And they that worship him 
must worship him in spirit and in truth. I'm going to stop the reading right there at verse 24. Keeping in mind what the word of God says. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Genuine worship of God is not relegated to a place. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad about that today? That you don't have to be in a specific location in order to worship God. That wherever you are, worship can take place. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit, the anointing that comes through your spirit, the anointing that teaches all of your children, God. We thank you for it this evening, and we ask that you would teach us right now. Teach us your word, oh God. In Jesus' name, amen. So worship is the topic of discussion. It is the text in which we read. Uh, that talks about the topic of worship and uh, that's what we're wanting to share with you this evening uh, from the theme or topic of worship and I want to talk about experiencing God through private worship experiencing God through private worship that first verse that we read as well, uh, Jesus said to this lady, a woman he was talking to at the says, "Neither shall your five, neither shall you worship me in this mountain, nor in Jerusalem." All right, Jerusalem was a place. Mount Gerizim was a place. That was the mountain that this lady was referencing and Jesus was referencing. He says, I'm not looking for people to worship me in a particular, pardon me, particular place or particular location. He says, they that will worship the Father must worship him in spirit and in truth. And again, I say, I'm glad that that's a truth that works today, particularly right now. Meaning, we do not have to be in a church building in order for true worship to take place. Amen? Amen. We can worship God wherever we may be. The context of this story as Jesus ministers to this woman, he finds, she finds herself under deep conviction. Deep conviction of her sins. That's the first truth of this text. When you enter the presence of God, you will become convicted of your sins. When you are in his presence, you will become convicted of your sins. I'll talk about that a little later on. But she realizes that she has a desperate need to get right with the Lord. Amen. And she needs a time of personal worship in her life. She perceives that Jesus is a prophet and supposes that he might be able to help her to understand when, where, and how she should approach God. Although her intentions were admirable, her concept of worship was flawed, even as millions, millions are today. Their concept of the worship of Almighty God is flawed, and is flawed to their own hurt into their own dismay. Uh, she thought 
that worship was about a certain time or a certain place or in a certain manner. Jesus clears up her misunderstanding and at the same time shares one of the greatest truths with her and with us, if you will. He teaches her. He teaches her that genuine worship is not and isolated is not isolated to a single place or some process or the other. Many people have that idea is all about. Others think worship takes place at a time when they're singing and preaching and testifying and shouting and all this kind of thing. And you hear statements like, man, boy, did we have church today? Okay, all right, so you had church. You hear, the pre hear, hear them saying, didn't the preacher preach today? They may have had a great time, but was there genuine worship? Did worship take place? And that's the thing that we are trying to emphasize today as we share with you from the Word of God and as Jesus shared uh, with this woman. Uh, it, 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 it is as natural for man to worship as it is for him to breathe. Mankind will find an object to direct his worship toward. Even the atheist will worship. Hallelujah. He just, he just directs his adoration toward himself, but he worships. God made us as worshiping creatures. And it is a fact. We will worship something or someone. What we are hoping will happen is that we will all worship what we should be worshiping, and that is the Almighty God. The one true, one true and living God. Amen. In America, sad to say that we have become polytheistic. We worship many gods. Amen. That's some religion, but it's not to be that of the Christian faith. We only worship one God. God said in the Ten Commandments, Thou shalt have no other gods with a little g before me. No other gods. We are to put God first in our life. The almighty God. The God that sent Jesus down to this earth to give his life because he loved us so much for us. Jesus went to the cross. They hung him on the cross at Calvary. He bled and he died as a result of wicked men. He bled and he shed his blood for you and I because God knows that there is no cleansing, forgiveness, purifying one of sin except through blood except through blood. And God sent his own son in the likeness of flesh. And he died for you and I because he loves us so much. Amen. So there's only one God. No other, no other religion can boast that. No other uh, faith can boast that. That their God loved them so much that he gave his only begotten son. Muslims don't even believe God had a son. So how can that be a reality in their life? God sent his only begotten son. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. The only God. The only one that have done that, that has done that, is the almighty God. Sits high, looks low. Amen. 
He sent his son. His son died for us. Consequently, he is the one that we should worship. He is the one. He's the only one that we should be worshiping. Worshiping. And so, the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, that one of these days, ultimately, he will prove that he is the only true and living God. One day he will prove that. You know, with all the signs and stuff that's going on right now, he's hoping somebody will wake up and see that he's in control. That he is a God that's in control. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. We are, we are his people. We're the sheep of his pasture. He made us and not we ourselves. Amen. He is the God that made us. And therefore, we should worship our creator. We shouldn't worship our ability to worship, but we should worship the one that created us. And so, ultimately, he will prove that he is the only true and living God. Because in Philippians chapter 2, he says in the conclusion of this whole thing, and it looks like we're moving in that direction pretty fast right now. He says that every knee is going to bow. And every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. Every knee is going to bow. Every knee. Black knee, white knee, brown knee, red knee, pink knee. Every knee is going to bow. And every tongue is going to confess. That Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. That's only one. He is the only one that we should be worshiping, God Almighty. And so, mankind will find an object to direct his worship. I'm saying to you, based on this text, it should be Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of the Father. And I said, worship is to, to the believer... What an engine is to the car. Or what a mainspring in, uh, 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 is in a watch. Yeah, worship is quite important. It is absolutely indis a indispensable part of our Christian experience. Genuine worship. Our great need then is to discover what genuine personal wish, worship involves so that we might be able to experience God and His fullness in our daily lives. To do this, we must try and get a handle on this thing called worship. Worship is, is not something, brothers and sisters, we only do on Sunday. Worship is done seven days a week. We recognize God every day of our lives. We should. We should give Him thanks. We should praise Him. We should acknowledge Him. We should repent before Him every day of our lives. And you don't need to be in a physical building in order for that to happen. So what is worship? It's a good question to ask based on what we're talking about this evening. And if you were to ask a hundred people, you'll probably get a hundred different answers. You ask a, a Pentecostal, you'll get one answer. You ask a Roman Catholic, you'll get another uh, answer. You ask a Baptist, and you'll get another answer. You'll probably get three distinct answers based on what worship is. I discovered in looking at this topic that uh, uh, this, this, this one fellow by the name of William Temple defines worship, and I think it's a good worship, good working de definition 
for worship is not the only one by no means. To worship is to quicken the conscience by the holiness of God, to feed the mind with the truth of God, to purge the imagination by the beauty of God, to open the heart to the love of God, and to devote the will to the purpose of God. That is a good definition of what worshiping is all about. The word worship comes from an old Anglo-Saxon term, if you will, uh, worth-ship, worth-ship. It literally means to attribute or ascribe a man uh, worth to someone, to describe worth to something or to someone. It carries the idea of declaring the object of worship as being something worthy to be honored or to be exalted. The Greek word in the New Testament that is most often translated worship uh, is um, proskuneo, proskuneo, proskuneo. This word means to kiss the hand uh, to one in a token of reverence, to kiss the hand in the, to uh, in the token of reverence. Also by kneeling or prostration to say homage. The second most common word uh, uh, in the New Testament is uh, sabomia. This word means to revere. Other words are used, but these are sufficient in, in what I want to talk about this evening uh, with us. And with these thoughts in mind, let's spread some time, spend some time in the passage uh, that is before us, the fundamental truths that uh, lay the foundation for what true worship really is. And, uh, uh, and we're talking about the genuine worship of God. It doesn't matter what I think or you think Amen. What we think about genuine worship has to be based on the truths of God's word. And so in verse 24, if you look at verse 24, we will discover genuine worship must coincide with the nature of God. Genuine worship must coincide with the nature of God. In this verse, Jesus reveals the truth that God is a spirit. That is, God does not have a physical substance as we perceive it. He is a being who transcends the physical world with all of its limitations. God is spirit. As a result, any worship that is to reach God must therefore be spiritual in nature. The rituals and practices of the flesh will not suffice to produce genuine worship. Genuine worship that is acceptable to the Almighty God. We, we can find several instances of worship in the Bible that were spiritual in nature. Uh, in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 20, you can write this down, look at it later on if you will. But in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 20, David lost his son as chastisement for his sin with Bathsheba. Bathsheba. I'm going to say that again. 2 Samuel 12, 20, David lost his son as chastisement for his sin with Bathsheba. Instead of rebelling against the hand of God in his life, David repented. That's what he did. He got up after his son and he repented under the lash and, and worshiped the Lord. He wasn't angry with God, but it would seem that his heart was repentant, repentant rather, and his life was changed. Amen. Because he accepted what God had done. And perhaps this event was 
the catalyst that brought Psalms 51 and 52 to be the uh, unction of Scripture. Uh, this is a worship that is consistent with the omnipotent nature of God. 2 Samuel 12, 23. Uh, this is a true example of genuine spiritual worship. You know, we have a tendency when things go bad in our lives, you know, and I know the whole concept is wrong, but I'm just going to say how we act. Uh, you know, when things are going wrong or we're having uh, 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 bad experiences in our lives, we will stop going to church to worship. We'll stop doing that because we're having a difficult time. When David uh, lost his son, David got up, repented, and worshipped God. And David knew what David knew what was going on in his life. David knew what he had done was wrong. And so when God chastised him, he didn't get angry and upset at God. He did the only thing that was right to do at that time, which was to repent and worship God for who he is. This was a true example of genuine spiritual worship. And then there is the worship of submission. John, I'm sorry, Job chapter 1, verse 20. I'm sure many of you all are familiar with this. Job has just received word that his children, along with his earthly possessions and wealth, are gone. And instead of fighting against the Lord in rebellion, Job displays all the classic signs of mourning, but he also falls down before the Lord and worships him. And notice in both of these cases, well, Scripture talks about these men worshiping. They were not in a physical facility. Amen. They were alone with God. He submits to God's plan for his life. Even though he doesn't like it or understands it, he submits to God. For all brothers and sisters, would to God that we would accept his will for our lives, because his will for our lives is the best life that we can experience on the face of this earth while we are here in the physical. We don't understand all of the things that the Lord does with, through us, but if we know God loves us, we have to trust that he's doing what's right and best for us, no matter how difficult it seems to be, no matter how difficult it is for us to deal with. If we are wanting God's will to be done in our lives, then we need to pray and accept it, give God thanks and worship Him. Now, let me parenthetically throw this in. This is not a part of the worship this evening, but it is where we're all living today. Uh, most of us, uh, particularly Democrats, <laughs> uh, are hoping that Mr. Trump will experience his last year in office. Amen. I'm not uh, ashamed to say that because that is the mindset of many people. However, Mr. Biden, Vice President Biden, uh, is his rival. And there are those who are hoping that he will defeat, overthrow Trump. But here's the reality, my brothers and sisters. The reality is whoever God wants to be in that office will win this election. Be it Trump or Biden, whoever God chooses. And so it's no need of getting our feathers all ruffled 
Amen. Do do your American duty. Do your full uh, Christian duty and vote by all means. But you leave the results to God. Because whomever God wants in that office is who's going in there. Amen. That's who's going to be in that office. And uh, I know I'm right about it. You, you need to simply read the Old Testament and see how God worked with the kings of that day and his people of that day. He, the Bible says that God puts up one and takes down another. He'll take down one and put up another. That's God's business. Why? Because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and God can do what he wants to do with his earth. And I really believe right now God is doing something with his earth. God is doing a new thing. He's doing a new thing, brothers and sisters. You don't have to like it. You don't have to accept it, but God is doing it. And listen, it's not just affecting the Baptist or the Methodist or the Catholic or the Buddhist or the Muslim. It is affecting everybody, not just one ethnic group. It's affecting every. God is behind this thing. God is doing this. Amen. Why? Because the earth is the Lord's. Now, he either sends it directly or he allows the devil to do it. He sends it directly or he allows the devil to do it. Because what? God is all powerful. He has all power in his hand. Hallelujah. And I accept God's will. I accept whatever he does because I believe whatever happens is going to be for my good. Amen. Romans 8, 28. Let me get back to our topic of discussion this evening. Worship is about submission. Job's act of worship when he lost everything was an act of submission to the will of God for his life. Uh, not only that, but there is the worship of devotion. Genesis 22, verses 1 through 18, especially verse 5, where Abraham has been asked to, asked by God to take his beloved son Isaac to Mount Moriah and offer him up as sacrifice to the Lord. Abraham does not question God's command, but willingly goes to do as the Lord has said. It is, it is worthy of to note that verse 5 shows Abraham as a man on the way to worship. Amen. Not a man who is about to slay his son. Abraham pictures for us the great truth that personal worship may be a costly thing. To truly worship God may cost you something. I know oftentimes it will cost you your pride. You might have to give it up and turn it loose to truly worship God. Some folk can't do that. Some folk think they're the captain of their soul, the master of their faith. They're going to choose what they do. Well, you can do that if you want to, but I promise you, genuine worship will not take place until you get out of self and allow the spirit man to take over. And so... Uh, Abraham, you 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 know that this is just common sense. You know you've got to be a, of the spirit of God to be asked to take your child to a mountain and offer them as a sacrifice, and you do it without grumbling or without murmuring. You know you've got to be of the spirit to do that. Abraham was of the spirit, but notice what happened when he genuinely. Uh, worshiped God, when he genuinely worshiped God, when he was about to offer his son as a sacrifice physically, God told Abraham to stay his hand, hold that knife, not plunge it into his son. He said, but look over 
and you'll find a ram in the bush. That's where we get ram in the bush from. The ram became the sacrifice, and, and his son Isaac was free. So that was genuine worship. Genuine worship sometimes is going to cost you. Hallelujah. So Abraham pictures for us the great truth that personal worship may be quite costly, but that genuine devotion to the Lord overshadows that and produces a willingness to be a worshiper, to pay the price to participate in worship of such, of such a great God. Now these are merely three instances of three circumstances, uh, and there are others in the Bible, but these are sufficient to teach us the truth of what genuine worship is. The flesh and it desire in its desires were placed on the back burner. The worshiper was most interested in doing the will of the Lord from the heart than in gratifying the flesh. Some folk are so prideful and caught up in the who they are they will never be able to truly worship God. Amen. They will never be able to truly worship God because they, they, they worship the creature more than they do the Creator. It, I mean, it just stands a reason God made us and we should worship the one that made us. It is He that has made us and not we ourselves, so says the word of God. And so we should, we should worship him. Genuine worship must coincide with the nature of God. Now, secondly, verse 24, genuine worship must be centered in the spirit. What did he say? Those that worship me must worship in spirit and in truth. And in conversing with this woman, Jesus tells her that those who worship God must do so in spirit. Genuine worship of God is not the fleshly display we sometimes call worship. Hello. No, no, no. The, the, the worship may be indeed manifest in some of these things sometimes. Itself in itself is not necessarily vocal or visible. Amen. It's not necessary. Uh, David, he worshiped the Lord in two distinct manners, and both were per perfectly acceptable to the Lord. First, he danced before the Lord. Amen. He danced before the Lord in humble amazement. That's Second Samuel. Chapter uh, 6, verse uh, 14 through 16. Then, simply stated, you can't tell how much uh, gas in the tank by how loud the horn honks. Especially, worship is a spiritual matter. Worship, instead of being an event that happens externally, always begins internally. Hallelujah. Begins within the spirit of man. Genuine worship from the spirit can be said to be, first of all, uh, worshiping God with the entire spiritual driven, if you will, ability of the soul, seeking the most intimate fellowship and communion with God. Well, then how, how can a person develop a worshiping spirit? What is required for us to enter into his, uh, this kind of spiritual realm? Well, we are actively seeking God in fellowship and worship. There are five great realities that must, be, must take place in order for this to happen. Can I give you these five things right quick? Number one, we must be born again. Amen. We must be, John chapter 3, born again. Authentic worship 
The authentic worship of God can only be found in a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And salvation is the first step in developing a worshipful spirit. Only access that any person has to the Father is through, you got it, the Son. 1 Timothy 2 and 5. Secondly, we must be yielded to the Holy Spirit. How can we worship in spirit if we're not obeying the Holy Spirit? We have to listen to Him and be guided by Him in worship. All genuine worship of God is the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. Who knows Lord better? Who knows the Lord better than the Holy Ghost? <laughs> First Corinthians 2 and 11. Therefore, as the believer yields to the influence of the Spirit of God in his life or her life, worship will be the result. Worship that is not motivated and directed by the Holy Spirit will be flawed and at best blasphemous at its worst. The Holy Spirit must lead in worship. Number three, our thoughts must be centered on God. Our thoughts must be centered on God. God. Amen. That's three of them. Amen. It's not metaphysical. It's not mystical. You know, it's not all that Eastern kind of religion in terms of worshiping. No, it's not. But it's in the spirit of the living God. Amen. Our thoughts must be centered on God. Amen. Amen. All right. So why is it that some are often in, in the place of worship and yet they are not holy? It's because they neglect their closets, if you will. They, they, they love the wheat, but they do not grind it. They would have the corn, but they will not go forth into the field to gather it. The fruit hangs on the tree, but they will not pluck it. And the water flows at their feet, but they will not stoop to drink it. Sounds like us, doesn't it? We get so busy doing the things that we see as being urgent, and we take no time for the one thing that is really important. And that is spending time at the Savior's feet. Luke 10 and 42. Now, brothers and sisters, if there ever, if, if, if genuine worship is ever going to take place, now is the time to put it in practice. During this COVID-19, you are home, you're quarantined, you're by yourself. Now is the time to practice genuine worship of God. Remember I said it's not about a place, it's not about a location. So, spending time with God, spending time at the feet of God, you can do that. And that is the catalyst, that is the motivation for genuine spiritual worship to take place, spending time with God. It was necessary for Jesus to do it. Jesus did it. He took time to be alone with his Father. How much more do you and I need those same kind of times? Amen? Times of solitude with God. Jesus did it. Mark 125, Mark 646, Luke 442, Luke 6, 12, 
Luke 22, 36 through 46. All of these times is when Jesus, the Bible records Jesus having spent private time with his father. Uh, if you need to get those scriptures, just save this video and you can go back and get them. I'll give them to you one more time. Mark 135, Mark 646, Luke 442, Luke 12, Luke 22, 39 through 46. It is virtually impossible to center the thoughts on the Lord unless we're willing to fill our mind with his thoughts on a regular basis. David hit the nail on the head when he described the desire he possessed in his heart to be near the Lord. Psalms 42 and verse 1. This is the all-consuming love that should fill every heart today. There must be nothing that is allowed to eclipse the Lord in our lives. Do, do you have a regular time Amen. Structured time. Set aside to meet with the Lord. That's called private devotional time that leads to the worship, genuine worship of God. I suggest to you, my brothers and my sisters, that you make that a priority in your life. Amen. Now, and even when we return to the buildings for our worship, but that we do not continue spending private time alone with the Lord. Amen. You need to remember, amen, to do that. You will need the Lord and the way to have him draw closer is that you need to draw closer to him yourself. And James 4, 18 says, if you draw closer to him, he will draw closer to you. So drawing closer to him means putting away the things of the flesh and are not allowing those things to dominate you but that you are dominated by the truths of God's word and spending time with God, with him, in his holy word. Amen. Spending time with him in word, that's him talking to you, and then reading, studying his holy word is God talking to us. Studying the scripture. Reading the scripture, reading devotional books, amen, listening to tapes or whatever you need to do, but you truly need to worship him. And then the fourth thing, and, the, and, and one more, we must have an undivided heart. God and God alone, and I talked about that initially when we got started, God and God alone must be the focal point of our worship. We must ever guard against the temptation to allow the Lord to be crowded out by millions of thoughts. Amen. Millions of thoughts of other things. We must. And you know that takes practice. It takes practice to focus on one thing. Because in this day and time in which we're living, our minds are flooded with everything but. Amen. You spend hours before the TV. The TV is not talking about God nor the things of God. Amen. The only place you're going to get the truth of God's word is from the word of God and from the preacher or the teacher when we're in church. That's the only place. Amen. Everything else is secular. Everything, is a, everything else is about the natural aspect of man. And remember, worship is a spiritual thing. And if you cannot get into the spirit, if you cannot be controlled by the spirit, if you cannot allow him to dominate your thinking, 
you can never worship the Lord. Amen? Yeah, it, it's easy to allow all kinds of other things to dominate your thinking. But we must learn to have a heart that is, as David says, fixed on God. Psalms 108 and 1. Psalms 108 and 1. And then the fifth thing is we must have a repentant heart. A repentant heart. Did you know that's what feet washing is all about? That's what feet washing is all about. Jesus said, you that is clean is clean every whit. But you need not, you know, wash feet. But you're clean every whit. What is he saying? What is he talking about? He's talking about the fact that you've been saved, but at the same time, you need to get clean every day by going before God in prayer, asking him to forgive you of your sin. You say, oh, pastor, I don't have any sin. I'm not doing anything. Listen, whether you're doing anything or not that you are conscious of, I can almost guarantee you that's something that you're doing wrong that uh, is contrary to the holiness and to the will of God. Some thought, some deed against God. Whether you realize it or not, you are doing it. And so you need to have a repentant heart every day of your life. And in order for genuine worship, genuine worship to take place, brothers and sisters, we must have a repentant heart. Just as worship involves all these other things also, it also involves the concept of cleansing and purging. Amen? Cleansing, purging, purifying, confession, repenting. And that's something that we all should be doing right now before God. We should be repenting before God of our wrongdoing. You don't have to be in church to repent. You don't have to be in church to have a genuine heart of worship before God. You can do that right there where you are. Second, uh, again, Second Chronicles 714. I think I've probably quoted that more in the last couple of months than I have all of my life in my preaching and my teaching because it is so relevant to this age and time in which we're living and which we're living right now. God said, if my people, that's the church, God's people, the church, God's people, the Jews, God's people. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, you certainly can't have a prideful spirit or a heart and go into the presence of God and expect God to hear you. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray. That's why I say hey, you have to have a little talk with the Lord. Seek my face. Sometimes you got to stay there. You can't just go there for a hot second and jump up and leave. you got to seek him in prayer. Seek him. Search for him in your heart. In your prayer. Get in touch. Get in tune with the Spirit of God. You can't do that in a hurry. You got to take time to know God. Take time to get in His presence. He said, and seek my face. And then you got to turn from your wicked ways. Uh-huh. Christian people can be some very wicked people. And I don't want to even get into that. They can be quite wicked. You know, the very fact that you refuse to do genuine worship is a wicked act, is a wicked behavior because God is so deserving of our worship, of our genuine worship. Amen. So you need a repentant heart in order for serious, acceptable worship to take place before God. And I say, all of us need to do that on a daily basis. We all have some dark spots. We all have what is uh, often said and has been said over the years. 
We all have skeletons in the closet. Amen. We all have thoughts of those skeletons. Amen. And, and we all have hidden sins and areas of impurity that keeps genuine worship from occurring when we refuse to repent. Amen. Uh, only when every nook and cranny of our lives have been cleansed and the sin done away with can we uh, uh, can we there be in a close relationship with the Lord. He promised if we would draw nigh to him, he would draw nigh unto us. And this can only happen when we have purged ourselves of sin. That's what David said in Psalms 51. David said, wash me and I shall be clean. He said, purge me and I shall be whiter than snow. But all these things are in place in our lives. Amen. Then we can enjoy the depths of genuine spiritual worship. Amen. And, and by the way, our public worship <laughs> is absolutely dependent on what we are or what we do in private. Amen. When all things are in, in place in our lives, then we can enjoy the depths of genuine spiritual worship. Public worship is absolutely dependent on what we are and what we do in our private lives. Until we learn to experience God through private spiritual worship, and here again, there's the time, brothers and sisters, to practice this worship that's acceptable to God. Listen, if you can't worship in private, you certainly can't worship in public because worship of God is a private thing. Amen. We can never hope to worship Him in a corporate manner if we can't worship Him in a private manner. Hallelujah. I thank God for his word. Where well, two or three are gathered in my name, he said, I'll be there in your midst. But at the same time, he said, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. So whether in corporate or whether alone, genuine worship of God can take place. And I trust that you will do that. You practice his presence right now, all by yourself. Amen. When you practice his presence in private, it is no problem when you come into the presence of others to worship him. Amen. And give him what he so rightly deserves. Genuine worship must coincide with the nature of God. God is a holy God. He will not tolerate sin in his presence. Amen. And so we have to repent of our sin. Uh, secondly, genuine worship must be centered in the spirit. And this is the one that I'm not going to get to today, but maybe we'll pick it up. Next Wednesday, genuine worship must be constituted upon the reality of who God is. Amen. And we often say, God is God all by himself. He needs nothing or nobody to authentic authenticate his godness. He is God alone. There's none that can rival the truth and living God. They can try, but there's none that can rival him. And that's why we need brothers and sisters to put him first in our life. Put him first in our worship. That we might worship the only truth and living God. Somebody listening to me today, 
you've not done the very first uh, thing, the first act that is required for genuine worship, and that is to accept Christ as your personal Savior. And uh, that is one of the one of the uh, criteria for uh, genuine worship to occur. You must be born again. You must be born again. Jesus told Nicodemus, marvel not. In other words, don't don't debate with me, Nicodemus. Don't argue with me. You must be born again. That which is born in the flesh is the flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. If you never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and you want to do that today, hey, I encourage you to do it while you have heard the word, while you're under conviction, while the Spirit of God is talking to you. The Bible simply says, if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in thy heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For the, with a heart man believes unto righteousness, and with a mouth confession is made unto salvation. If you will confess him today, you can be on your way. You can possess eternal life, have the first catalyst and the first uh, uh, criteria for giving him genuine worship. Amen. To as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become a son of God. You can you can be his child of God, and he will accept your worship when you confess your sins. Amen. Before God. Amen. If you if you would confess your sins, the Bible says, First John 1 and 9. He faith, he's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He's standing right there at your heart's door, waiting for you to open and let him in. If you let him in, you will experience a brand new life. You will then be able to worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen. 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 Hopefully you got something from the study this evening. Uh, we will, if God says the same, continue. Uh, next Wednesday we talk about genuine worship. Amen. Because it's something that we should be doing even now. Uh, that we are uh, confined to our homes and places uh, that uh, is open in this COVID-19. God bless you. We love you. We love every one of you. Amen. We love you. And we thank God so much for you. We love our brothers and sisters of the faith, but we also love every person on the face of this earth, meaning there's nothing we wouldn't do if we could to help you, number one, to get to know God, and secondly, to share uh, physical means with you. And the Bible says, how good is the love of God in your heart? You see, if your brother have need, it shut it up, your bowels of compassion. Hallelujah. Pastor of the New Sardis Church, we're here for you, even though confined to our home. God bless you. Don't forget to pray for Deacon Prater and his family. Amen. See you next time. Goodbye.